On today's Locked on Jayhawks, we start our early look aheads of KU's first two opponents, Lindenwood and Illinois, and we preview the defensive end room, which is maybe the biggest fulcrum to the defense improvement. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, I'm Derek, Derek Johnson, at D Johnson Radio on Twitter. Thanks for making Locked on Jayhawks your first listen every day. We're free and available anywhere you get your podcasts, including on our YouTube page where you can like and subscribe to the show. Thank you to the everydayers catching each and every show. Apologies, we did not have a show on a Monday. Had a uh, medical thing in the family that I had to attend to. So thank you for bearing with us. And we will have a bonus episode today on your Tuesday to make up for it. So. No worries there, right? We'll have a basketball episode later today. Today, though, we are talking KU football. We're talking the early preview of their first two games, KU Lindenwood and KU Illinois. And we're going to get to our defensive end room preview, which is, I don't know, maybe the most biggest X factor of the positions on the KU defense to, to their improvement this season. This episode of the show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. As the playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with the booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So just visit FanDuel.com to get started today. All right, we're going to start with our Lindenwood early look ahead. Then we'll get to our early preview of the Illinois game. And we'll finish up on it, the defensive ends. So... This first game with Lindenwood, it's obviously an FCS opponent. It's one that they were in the NAIA like, I don't know, a decade ago, basically. And they just kept creeping up the levels of college football now in the FCS. And this is not a team that is supposed to be a great FCS team this season, to kind of say the least. So they went three and seven last year. This is their second year of transitioning up from Division two. Again, prior to that being NAIA. Uh, They bring back 14 starters, so maybe they'll end up creeping closer to 500. Um, Seven back on offense, seven back on the defensive side of the ball. So a good amount of experience there at the very least. Three of which are returning all league selections among the 14 returning starters. They have a receiver who was an all-conference pick, Jeff Caldwell, one at defensive line in Kobe McClendon, and then one at linebacker, uh, Ethan Stolsatz. I don't know if that's the proper way to pronounce that. Anyway, they have seven transfers coming in from the D1 level, from the FBS level, I guess we sh- I should say, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, from FBS, but not all Power 5. Uh, so they have one from Power 5, as I continue to mix up my words here. Um, that was actually a walk-on, coincidentally, at Kansas. That was Reese Thomas. So overall, three FBS transfers, one from Power 5, and even that one was was – uh, a walk on there, but I don't know, maybe a Reese Thomas revenge game against KU in this one. But overall, this is a game that that you're going to be pretty heavy favorites in. Uh, they ranked just 77th in FCS football last season in yards per play. There are 128 FCS teams, by the way, if you're wondering. They ranked 87th in yards allowed per play a year ago. So, you know, I, I guess both of those aren't in the 100th, uh, in the 100 range. Like, that's good. They were, I guess, Below average to bad at both. Maybe they can be average at both. And with all the starters back, they're a five and five team, like I said, and, and maybe they're a little better than last year. But uh, they finished just 108th among 128 FCS teams on ESPN SP Plus. And on ESPN SP Plus, they have the 102nd best offense in the country and the 108th best defense there, again, of 128 teams. So that looks a little bleak. There is a QB competition for them. Um, overall, the defense, I think, has more certainty back, even though both have seven starters back, just because, uh, I mean, the quarterback is such a key position that it's a little bit more uh, knowing what you got there. I don't think that this is like 2016 Rhode Island bad. That was another level there, which, by the way, if that 2016 Rhode Island team, because that was against, like, still David Beatty bad KU. If that was against like Lance Leipold, good KU, that Rhode Island team, it's like 80 to nothing. I don't know. It would have been very, very bad. So I don't think it's like that bad. But among the FCS teams that KU has played since Lance Leipold's been here, so South Dakota, which almost beat them in year one, which that was a good South Dakota team, at least a solid South Dakota team. Um, And then you look at what Tennessee Tech. Oh, gosh, I don't even remember who it was last year at this point. Um, Oh, Missouri State, of course. Like this is 
probably the worst one that they've played in the Leipold era. And this could also probably be the best KU team in the Leipold era, right? We'll see what ends up happening this year compared to last year, which was a good season. But like on paper, you expect this one to be better than last year's one, right? So that just kind of leads to a formula where you're having uh, expectations of it it being a, a wide result in, in favor of KU, which I think that expected result is, is for KU to kind of smash them. Um, basic offense should work here. And that's been something that's been a common theme for KU their last two years in FCS games. They've been able to run just basic, you know, half halfback stretch or their wide zone plays or whatever you want to call it, halfback dive, just like straight up basic, basic stuff. We're not giving away too much on film and in the playbook. And it works because you just have better players and you can execute your simple stuff, which is the hallmark of a good team. And you can do that early in the season against a lesser opponent. Your offensive line dominates and defensive line dominates the game. You dominate the line of scrimmage and your running backs just out athlete the other team. And boom, Devin Neal ends up with four carries for like a hundred yards. You know what I mean? Um, So they shouldn't have to get too adventurous, basically. Just line up and dominate the game. So what are what's going to be the key for KU like that? Just dominate in the trenches and you're going to be okay. And that was the case the last two years. Like, you know, looking back on it, there were a couple of plays where even Austin Booker, which was kind of an unknown commodity at that point in the first game, you just saw that first step looking really good coming around the edge. And it was like, okay, showing a little bit something, but I want to see him do it against an FBS opponent. Well, it was still a, a at least, I don't know, show that, Hey, there's something here. And even the year before, like Lonnie Phelps had what it was like four tackles for loss and three sacks in the FCS game where it's not that he ever had another three sack game for KU in the FBS competition, but you could see in that first game, like, okay, that's a dude, right? And, and so you're looking for that stuff. You're looking for that on the offensive and defensive line, just dominate in the trenches. Just don't do stupid things, penalties, turnovers, et cetera. It can be a little bit harder in the first game of the season, but certainly you want to feel clean coming after that first game. And then the most important thing, uh, for KU, just stay healthy. The more you dominate early, the the sooner the starters can get out, the sooner that you can give playing time to younger guys and players further down the depth chart, which will be good for their development and their play time and keeping everybody happy, stuff like that. So uh, no injuries is kind of the biggest thing in that first game. And just win the game because you can't afford to lose a game like that. Anyway, uh, let's get on to our early preview of the KU-Illinois game because I think there's a little bit more substance to that one on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. We are brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sporting like we want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. You want to get Jalen Daniels to win the Heisman at 40 to 1 odds? You want to get Kansas to make the college football playoff at 6 to 1 odds or win the Big 12 or take the over on the 8.5 wins or pick the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl at 6 to 1? Is that crazy that the Chiefs and KU have the same odds to, I don't know who that'd be crazier for, the Chiefs to win the entire thing, KU just to make the playoff? I I guess it makes sense when you think about it. But uh, this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com. Start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. All right, continuing on, thank you to every day who's tuning into each and every show on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. Again, we'll have a bonus episode later today that is uh, talking about David Coit, who is KU's newest transfer addition in Northern Illinois, or from Northern Illinois, averaged over 20 points per game and how that could affect the rotation for KU and which players it could affect the most for KU hoops. Let's get to our early look at the KU-Illinois game. And when you look at Illinois... This is a team you played a season ago. You played in Lawrence. It was a Friday night game for KU. They had the blackout with the cool black uniforms that I think everybody's hoping that they wear again for a game this season. I'm trying to think which game should they do the blackout for? Hmm. That's a good question. Do you do it early in the season on a Friday night again with like the UNLV game? Or do you use it on a a Big 12 game? I, I feel like that would be probably the better call. And then if you use it on a Big 12 game, which one do you do is kind of the question. Because, like, Iowa State sometimes wears black. Colorado sometimes wears black. So, like, do you not want to do it in those? I don't know. Kind of an interesting question. Anyway, uh, didn't need to get too much into that. Uh, Illinois went from eight wins in 2022 down to five wins in 2023. And that was after – 
they lost a ton of talent from that 2022 team, specifically to the NFL draft and specifically in the secondary. Like their entire starting secondary was drafted into the NFL. And I'm pretty sure they had three picks. It might have been all four. It was at least three got drafted in the first two days of the NFL draft, meaning top three round draft picks. And they had um, obviously their, their big one go in the top 10 to the Seahawks at the corner position. So like there was a lot to lose for a program like Illinois in the same way that would be a lot to lose for a program like Kansas. Um, so we saw Kansas beat them 34 to 23 last season. That was a score that honestly was misleading to how, I guess, how much KU dominated that game. Because that was a game where, like, you look up at the end of the season and you're like, oh, Kansas, you know, beat Illinois by 11 points. And Illinois ended up being a, a five and seven team. Like, yeah, that was a fine win for KU. Like, it could have been more, but that was it. Like, KU just kind of let their foot off the gas pedal. You had in the second half of that game, you had the Kobe Bryant and Austin Booker like targeting calls where they were out for the rest of that game. And like, looking back, those are two all big 12 first team players that you were without for a half. So like, Oh, you were outscored 16 to six by Illinois without your probably two best defensive players a season ago. And it took weird stuff happening. Like Luke Altmaier running free for a 72 yard touchdown, like on just a weird um, nobody's there. And also you just let your foot off the gas. You were up 34 to seven. You're up 34 to seven with three forty six to go in the third quarter. Like at no point did you feel like you were going to lose that game. You know what I mean? You out yarded them. Um, 539 to 341. Like, I mean, you dominated the game. You, you were much better than, than the score kind of indicated there. And, and to point being, it'd be easy to say, okay, well, they say on average you lose three to four points for like home field advantage, and that means the other team could gain that. That could be a six to eight point swing. Are we talking about a coin flip game in Illinois? And maybe it ends up being, because maybe Illinois just ends up being a lot better of a team. I'm going to get into what they have back and everything like that. But my point is, I wouldn't view it that way because I view that game as being like, yeah, Kansas was probably like 21 points better. I don't know. So now this year, Illinois returns uh, between five to six offensive starters. Kind of depends what you're looking at. Some of the different preseason magazines view it differently. Some of them view it as like, how many do you return from your team that were starters? I know like Phil Steele's magazine counts. Um in today's day and age, he's adjusted to this with the transfer portal. If you bring in a transfer who started at another school and he's projected to start for you, um, then he'll count that as a returning starter, you know, which I, I think makes sense in today's day and age. So somewhere between five to six offensive starters, somewhere between five to seven defensive starters. Overall, they have 39 lettermen back. They have 29 lettermen gone. And 12 of those left via transfer at the spring in the April portal opening, which that's obviously worse than just regular losses like graduation or, or even a player transferring after December to have 12 players leave after the April transfer portal. That seems like a lot. And obviously we talk about this a lot. Like it's harder to lose those guys because you don't have as much opportunity to backfill them. There's not as many players in the portal, not as many good players in the portal and also, like, those guys have gone through spring ball. They've developed a little bit more. They know the system a little bit more. They took reps from other players that could have been getting those reps in the spring. So that's tough for Illinois to lose all those players. Uh, Johnny Newton's gone from Illinois. I thought he was the best player in that game for Illinois against KU. He had a lot of good pressures on Jalen Daniels. The one I think of most, though, was the one where he pressured Jalen Daniels, and then Jalen just, like, darts away, scrambling, like, back in his own end zone and fires the dart downfield. Uh, so, you know, having Jalen's mobility – Still kind of counteracted it a little bit. But yeah, he had a good game in that one. He's gone. They do return Luke Altmaier, a quarterback who I thought was pretty solid in that game. Uh, he had some ups and downs throughout the season. I think at one point got benched, but then he finished the season strong and looks like he'll be taking another step into this year. They do have a typically solid offensive line with Brett Bielema team. So I just almost expect that to be the case. And just like same with the running backs, like you expect that to be good. But you know, they were a little underwhelming there last year, so we'll see. Uh, Phil Steele does give Patrick Bryant, who's one of their receivers, third team All Big Ten. JC Davis, who's a left tackle for them, fourth team. He's actually a transfer from New Mexico. And then second team on Lindy's there. Uh, center Josh Krutz was third team for All Big Ten on Lindy's preseason magazine. And then linebacker Seth Coleman, third team on Phil Steele and on Lindy's. So uh, those are some of the players to watch for there. What are going to be the keys for KU? I, I think you have to take advantage of turnover-worthy plays. That was one thing that kind of plagued Luke Altmaier 
Um, he was first in scramble yards actually for Big Ten quarterbacks. So, I mean, that'll be a key to is spying the quarterback. I mean, we saw it the over 70 yard rushing touchdown he had against Kansas a season ago, or, or just making sure he doesn't run all over you. He was also number two in deep passes. So, got to defend the deep ball. But the one thing that hurt Altmeyer last year, it was the 10 interceptions and four fumbles. So, 14 turnovers. And that was again, even getting, uh, I, I don't know if it was benched or injury or whatever uh, that caused him to miss some time at one point in the season. I think he's a pretty good quarterback year two now in a system after he was top six in QBR in the big 10 um, former highly recruited guy that was at Ole Miss. I think he's going to be solid, but he probably will give you a chance for a pick or two. So take advantage of those if you're KU and then just be yourself. Like I think KU is the better team going back to the idea that I think that game was more dominant than the score indicated, like just be you handle things on the road. Obviously that makes it tough. Um, is just being on the road and doing that early in the season and doing it for the first time in a season. Um, you have to be able to handle that as well. And then dominate the line of scrimmage. Like as much as I do view Brett Bielema teams, whether it was at Wisconsin or Arkansas or Illinois now, as typically having good offensive lines, it was not a super strength for them last season. And they do have a lot of new faces on the offensive line. You lost both tackles, even though you bring in a possible all-conference one from New Mexico. Uh, Phil Steele only ranks them the 17th best defensive line in the Big Ten without Jerzon Newton. So dominate on both lines of scrimmage. We're going to uh, get on to our defensive end room preview on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. Uh, by the way, for what it's worth, expected result, ESPN FPI has KU at about 11-point favorite on a neutral site, so maybe 7.5 to 8.5 in a road game. All right, defensive end preview on Locked on Jayhawks next. We are brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Again, thank you to the Everydayers tuning into each and every show. Make your second listen, Locked On College Football or Locked On Big 12 or one of the other schools in the Big 12. If you want to know more about them or, I don't know, maybe it's, you know, uh, Locked On with Illinois catching up with them after we just had our early preview of them. All right, let's get to our defensive end room preview for KU because this is maybe the fulcrum to the defense. You feel good about the secondary. You have a lot back. The depth behind it, even though it's maybe not super proven in terms of games played or you know, career production, I think has a lot of talent uh, from whether it's looking at recruiting levels or, um, you know, intel from what the staff has been high on for, for that. You feel good about the secondary. I feel good about the athleticism of the linebackers and that you're going to have a step up there. Um, I feel solid about the defense tackle room. I feel like you've got solid guys that you can rotate in there and, and a few guys that you can point to and say, okay, maybe they're going to have a breakout season, right? And that's always a good place to be. Defensive end room. I think it's interesting. You split it in two. You look at the strong side defensive ends, basically, and you have your Jeremy Robinsons, who's a senior, who we've seen produce at KU the last two seasons. You have Dylan Woodkey, who's a redshirt senior, who had really good production at Youngstown State before he transferred over. And then uh, I don't know who else, if, if Cole Petrus is competing more at the – the I guess weak side or if he's more on the strong side he's a redshirt sophomore he might be a walk-on maybe he's earned or is earning a scholarship I don't know but it sounds like he could play um also I I guess um I I guess we'd throw Ron McGee in here I I it sounds like he's working at defensive end he's been like a defensive tackle slash defensive end at points so he's coming off that injury that caused him to miss all of last season you feel good about that position like specifically with robinson and woodkey uh, you could end up with five six seven combined sacks there i don't know maybe even more than that a, a good amount of tackles for loss i feel really good that you're getting competent play whichever one is kind of rotated into the game 
Um, the big question there is the the weak side defense fence. You have Dylan Brooks, who's injured right now. He's a redshirt junior. I don't know if he'll be back at any point this season, but the former Auburn transfer who was very highly recruited, maybe this would have been a breakout year for him. But again, uh, he's injured right now. DJ Warner, who's the young freshman. Sounds like he's impressing so far. Dean Miller, who's a redshirt junior, former uh, Juco transfer from College of the Canyons, which is where like Jason Pierre Paul and, and Hollywood Brown went before they transferred up to uh, USF and Oklahoma, respectively, and Miller may be breaking out this year. Uh, then you have By Job, who's a redshirt freshman, former highly recruited guy from Michigan State. Dak Brinkley, who's a true freshman, he joined back in spring ball, got a little extra reps. Yeah, like I said, maybe Petrus, and then maybe Graydon Grimes. We mentioned him in the the D tackle. I don't know if their plan for Grimes is defensive end or D tackle for the true freshman and the son of uh, offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes. And then you got a couple more walk ons: Jaden Bittingham, who's a redshirt freshman, and Maxwell Ford who is a redshirt freshman. So the biggest storyline here is just, do you have the pass rush? I, I feel good about the requisite pass rush that you're going to get from the strong defensive end spot, which isn't going to be asked to be as good of a pass rush as the weak side. Maybe it does need to be just this year because of, you know, you need to make up for it somewhere by losing Austin Booker. And maybe you will get that production. Cause like I said, I mean, Robinson's been kind of a three, four sack guy the last couple of years. Uh, Wood key, you don't know totally know how his numbers translate up from Youngstown State, but he could very well kind of be in the same boat, and that would be good production from that position. But what are you going to get from the weak side spot? Can you get, I don't know, three from Dean Miller? Can you get two from DJ Warner and one from Dak Brinkley and, and two from By Job to where you're kind of – on aggregate building up the sack numbers from what you're getting from these guys, or will one guy just step up and break out and have six or seven sacks on his own and be that guy that kind of becomes the big question here. And if that can happen, I, I mean, I already feel like KU is going to have a chance to improve as a defense, even if it doesn't just because if you're better against the run and you're better at all these other positions, I think you could at least be a little bit better, but for you to be like a lot better for this, for this to all of a sudden become a, I don't know, a top 40, top 30 defense in the country. You have to have those improvements at those other positions that I'm kind of expecting or I don't know, wish casting or whatever it is. Um, but you also have to have this pass rush production come up for that level to happen. And I do think it's possible because you have all sorts of talent. You have all sorts of athleticism. You have all sorts of ceiling. And KU, give credit to Taiwo Onotolu and the KU, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's Brian Borland, Lance Leipold, whoever. But Onotolu, the defensive ends coach, for getting these guys ready seemingly year in and year out. We've gone through the list before from Kyron Johnson moving positions, from Lonnie Phelps transferring in as an all-Mac player, from uh, uh, from Austin Booker who hadn't really played much at, in Minnesota, and now what you're trying to do this year. He's been able to ramp guys up and get them to the requisite level needed, closer to what their ceiling is than need be. Now, all those other guys were upperclassmen. Even Booker, even though he was listed as a sophomore, he was a redshirt sophomore. He's still an upperclassman, his third year of school. And I guess that's the case for like Dean Miller, would be for Dylan Brooks if he's healthy. But yeah, that'll be uh, the big test here for KU. And, and like I said, talking about the run, that's I think another storyline here. Can you at least be better against the run? Because if you are better against the run, you're improving one area of your defense that even if the pass defense gets a little bit worse, maybe it makes up for it. Or maybe by being a better run defense, you're in more manageable downs. You're in more third and seven, third and eight, third and 12. And now it's more predictable. You can send more blitzes. Your defensive ends can pin their ears back because they know it's a pass situation that they don't have to on a third and three. You still have to, you know, worry about running the football. And, and maybe that takes a split second away from you rushing the passer. Um, if you can at least be better against the run, then, then this would still be uh, in it. I don't know, a chance for your defense to be improved, I guess I would say. So overall, better, worse, or the same to last year? I would say you're better at the strong defensive end spot. I would say you're worse at the weak defensive end spot. Austin Booker, by the way, just had like a huge game in the preseason. I could see him end up being like one of the steals of the draft. That that dude has unbelievable twitch. Uh, I think overall you would say you're worse. Just, I mean, Austin Booker was one of the best defensive linemen in the Big 12 last year. Um, but the question is, is it slightly worse? Or is it way worse, right? Are you going to get like no production from that spot from a bunch of unproven guys? Because that would be a big problem. Or is it slightly worse where, like I said, you're able to aggregate some of those players together where it's close enough and then the other positions can bring you together. And honestly, theoretically, like the ceiling of this defensive end group unit is actually higher than it was a season ago. Because I, I think the ceiling on what Dylan Woodkey to be could be is probably more than what Patrick Joyner, I mean, he was dealing with a bunch of injuries coming into KU. Um, Jeremy Robinson is a senior, probably higher ceiling than it was last season. 
as great as Austin Booker was, he was what a fifth round pick in the NFL draft. And maybe if he comes back this year, balls out, he would have been a second or third round pick. I don't know. But in theory, the the level to which like Deshaun Warner and by Joe were recruited, if those guys like hit at some point of college where like they eventually are a first team all big 12 guy, it might be a first or second or third round pick. You know, it's just a lot to ask because it's a lot of new players. It's a lot of freshmen. It's a lot of guys who haven't hit their ceiling yet in power four football or have played a ton of snaps or have given a lot of production or know what to expect and are super experienced or have their bodies to the hundred percent level. Now, uh, a lot of the bodies, it, it sounds like, you know, the weights are, are going to be okay. Like for DJ Warner, if he's playing 225, 230, that's doable. Again, we, we, we brought up past guys and that have shown up at other schools, uh, Kari Coleman at TCU, he was around 220 and he had a bajillion tackles for losses, a true freshman for TCU. So uh, it can happen, but you just got to see it out there. But I think there was a lot of potential at the very least in that room for KU, uh, even maybe more so than a season ago, whether they hit that potential or not remains to be seen. But based on how the last couple of years have happened, it does give you some faith that they can try to do it. All right, we're going to get to our early preview of the next couple of games, UNLV, West Virginia, receiver room preview later in the week. We'll also get to stocks up, stocks down on fall camp football players for KU. This has been Locked on Jayhawks.